All right, this is Barry Rabkin from Identify Technologies. Uh, thank you all very, very much for joining me today. Uh, this webinar is about how contractors use drone data to save millions on a project. And um, we're gonna start off just talking about the situation, I have a special limited time offer just for live attendees, and then open it up for audience Q&A. Um, you are going to be speaking with Jeff Gonzalez. He's a project engineer at Granite Construction. Uh, Jeff? Can you say hello to our audience? Hey, how's it going? Nice. Um, just so everyone knows how to uh, participate and engage, as you want to submit questions, and you don't have to wait till the end, you can ask questions at any point during the conversation. Um, you click on the arrow as shown here, and then you can enter your questions in the field as shown. All right, Jeff, um, I'm gonna just start off asking you to tell people a little bit about the company you work with, about Granite's history, and what services they offer. Well, Granite Construction is one of the largest heavy civil contractors in the nation. We've been around for 100 plus years, and uh, we do anything from moving dirt, paving asphalt, structural concrete, underground work, and yeah. Great. And how did you get involved with Granite? Can you kind of walk the audience through your uh, your professional background? Yeah. So when growing up, I mean, I always see the Granite green trucks on the side of the road working and was always interested in the company. Um, I ended up going to Fresno State and studying construction management. And Granite used to be around a lot in our program. Um, they actually sponsored our heavy civil competition, uh, aka the Reno competition that goes on in uh, February in Reno, Nevada. That includes all the construction management schools in the nation to come together, and they put they put together proposals on a project that Granite has done in the past. And that's what really got me interested was the type of projects that Granite works on. And yeah, they were just sponsored for that competition and we worked our team from Fresno State, heavy civil team, worked really close with their project managers and engineers to uh, come up with a detailed proposal on one of the projects that they actually built. Nice. Um, how did you get involved specifically with drone mapping? Uh, drone mapping, so it's always been a hot topic over the years like you know drones are gonna take over and be able to do all the topos for us and all the mapping um, I understood that planes could do it so why couldn't a drone do it so that's what got me interested in it and yeah just the technology side of it got me interested how it all works got it and how um, can you tell me a little bit about the specific project that you're working on with granite uh, right now? Yeah, so Granite was awarded a $10 million job in Santa Paula, California. It's called the Harvest at Limonera project. Uh, it's basically a rough grading project for a master community. There's going to be about a thousand homes in this community, a school, parks, um, commercial center, apartments, just a whole community that's about a third of the size of the town that's already there. It's about 360 acres. Wow. Five million, five million yards to move. Now, was the size of this job what made you interested in getting drone mapping for it, or was there something else? Yeah, definitely. Um, I knew it would definitely be an opportunity to, to experience, you know, the potentials of drone mapping and just knowing what I'm going to have to be doing for coming up with quantities that just made the most sense to use a drone to be able to help with that. And w when you say quantities, was there um, very specific reports or data that you wanted to be able to pull? Yeah, I, I definitely want the orthos, so all the pictures stitched together for one, and then, yeah, the DXF files and the point clouds so I could use to compare different services to the existing design to track progress and come up with our quantities every month. Makes sense. And why did you decide to use a managed drone solution rather than try to build something out internally at Granite? 
well, cost and time uh, specifically, but uh, to be honest, I don't know exactly what it takes to build a, a drone or you know get the drone going to be able to fly itself and process the photos, stitch them together, and come up with the DXF files and various files that I need to. And plus, it's just time. I just didn't. I didn't have the time on top of what I have to do for the project wise to um, yeah to get it done the right way. So for the drone mapping workflow that you do have to do on your end, um, forgetting about what's taken care of, but what what does the general sequence look like on your side of using a drone? Uh, well, so you guys supplied the drone for us in the software um, to fly the various maps. So what I do, I pretty much fly the whole site once or twice a week, um, especially on the 1st and 15th to come up with our bi-weekly or bi-monthly quantities. And uh, well, it starts with uh, setting ground control points, whether it's painting an X or dropping down an X that I painted on a piece of plywood on the perimeter or just using um, our storm drain manholes as you know, targets for the drone to recognize and then shooting them with our rovers and getting that ground control over to you guys. But it's pretty much just set up the drone, tell it where I want it to fly, or take it off, and the height that I want it to fly at, and yeah, flies, comes down, I take the pictures, and I upload it to your guys' site. Do you think you'd be interested in using PPK in the future to uh, sort of avoid the necessity for GCPs? Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, granted, Grant's never used you guys or used a drone on a type of project like this to come up with quantities. So we were kind of, you know, what's what's the cost benefit and time benefit of using the PPK versus using ground control points. And, you know, after seven months of being on the project and over, I think I've flown it at least 60 different times. Um, yeah, the PPK would definitely, <laughs> I would definitely recommend that on the next job. All right. Good to hear. It takes it takes time. I mean, I got 60 ground control points on this job, and I would say half of them are permanent that I don't have to really worry about. But the other 30, I gotta go check to make sure a scraper didn't run over it, take it out, or, <laughs> or a water pole went over it and washed away all the paint that I just painted. So it's kind of it takes me about 30 to 45 minutes to check on all the points that I know that are potentially gonna either be destroyed or I'm going to have to repaint. And j just for our audience that may not um, yet be familiar with those terms, can you just at a super high level explain the difference between um, kind of a standard uh, drone and a PPK drone in terms of what's required? Yeah, so I, from my understanding, PPK just talks to our base station and it doesn't need those ground control points that tie into the site. Um, yep. I haven't really dived too much into it. No, that's it. Um, that's <laughs> the that, understanding. It, it gets a little fancier under the hood, but in terms of practice, that's exactly what it is. Yeah, so, I mean, we have a permanent base station that we set up on our drop trailer, and yeah, it's, I, don't, I don't see that having to be difficult for the drone to be able to talk to our base station, our Trimble base station. Mm-hmm. And you you describe that hey this was really granted's first time using drone mapping and they wanted to um, see what the experience was going to be like. Um, was there any skepticism about what the quality was going to be like, maybe from surveyors, grade checkers, or other people in your organization? Yeah, of course. I mean, especially you know the people that are seasoned and you know don't really know much about it. Um, there was some skepticism about it, but um, we did some trials, you know, to compare, you know, an area that we shot with our rover with just a ground control pretty much shots and um, the same exact area of the drone. And what we found, it doesn't, there's not a huge difference. The only difference is the more detail you have with the drone because there's a lot more points that are being recorded compared to shooting with the rover, so say you shoot 100 rover points in that area, um, I think the amount of points that the drone produces is probably 10 to 20 times more than that, so it just gives you a lot more better detail. Yeah, the quantity was 
was off, but it's not off enough to be a huge amount. I just, it just makes sense because it's just giving you more detail. It's showing more highs and lows compared to if you shot nothing but the low points. But right. Over. And what what kind of tolerances do you normally look for on, on these sort of site prep projects? So our tolerances on contour grading is half a foot, two, two tents in the streets, and a tent on the blue top pads. So and I really, flying at 400 feet, it was there, you know, in the contours and streets and whatnot, but whenever I go and fly the neighborhood, I like to fly that at about 200 feet to 100 feet to get a better, get the tolerance down and get better accuracy. That, that, that's our client success manager's mantra is low and slow. <laughs> What's okay. Say that again, sorry. Oh, our, uh, our client success manager, Cassie, her mantra is fly low and slow for, for the best yeah. accuracy. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's just, it's when you fly lower, it's, going to be more flight on a 360 acre project that's say I it takes four flights for me to fly the whole entire site at 400 it's going to take me eight flights to fly it at 200. Right so it's only worth doing when you really need that uh, increased accuracy. Yeah so I have it set up to where I have four flights at 400 and then I have my eight like the areas that I want at a different altitude. Smart. So once you actually got into this job, um, were there any surprises? Yeah, definitely. So on April 5th, we hit an area of impacted soil and um, pretty much from April 5th to about a month ago, or let's say two weeks ago, we've been excavating this impacted soil that we found. and. It wasn't shown on any of the uh, geotechnical reports that we were, there was a potential of impacted soil, so it was somewhat of a surprise to us and the owners. And then after research and people looking into you know historical aerial photos and whatnot, and talking with the farmers, because that the site used to be an orchard for lemons and avocados. And so the background on it is back in the day, they had smudge pots, pretty much these pots that they would fill with kerosene or diesel or whatever. And they would light them on fire to heat up the orchards to have them not freeze in the winter. So there was about 20,000 of them on the site all over the place. And they had oil lines running from where the highway is and where the railroad is next to the highway, they would rail in huge amounts of oil and pump it up through the site to above ground storage tanks. And I think those got outlawed in the 70s. So from 1900s to about the 70s, they were pumping oil all throughout the site. And over time, those lines were either leaking or they didn't do a good job of making sure when they got done with that to mitigate all the oil that leaked out. So over time, in about, I we're hit about five areas where this impacted soil is, it's been a huge impact on the project. Each one of the areas that we hit, we've had to excavate from 100,000 to 200,000 yards of material out. Wow. And we did the impacted material on T&M but as we got deeper in certain areas, we had to make them wider with the scrapers, so we had to take overburn out, which we were being paid on contract quantity for the overburden, but the impact of soil was on TNM. Got it. And I'm just gonna show a couple of the pictures that you showed me on kind of the scale of, of this. So in what yeah, ways, so the, oh, go ahead, so with, with those pictures, you can see, if you go back to the first one, you can see the type of soil and the excavator taken out, but everything around it, we had to take out with scrapers to make the slope safe enough for everybody that was down there testing the soil and sniffing it. We had to get those to, you know, safe slopes. 
So with that, we had to take overburden around the impact of material out. Got it. Got it. Yeah, the scale of this job site is immense. So in, in what ways was drone data useful in, in kind of dealing with this surprise and making sure that um, you didn't have to just eat the cost of, of the added labor? So with the drone, I was able to see the limits of where we were excavating, and I was able to take that out of our quantities for overburden. And without that, it would have been really tough because we were always chasing always chasing this impacted soil and as we chased it we had to take out more overburden and we had to prove that to the owners that were taking out this much overburden and make sure this impacted material that's on TM is not included and without the drone it would have been very difficult we would have had to have a gray checker on site full time just topoing every single day the limit of excavated, impacted, and the limit of overburden that was excavated as well with our scrapers. How how did having that data help you in terms of cash flow on the job? Oh well, it helped a lot because we were able we were able to prove to them like that we took out this much overburden and it, that it wasn't you know, the impact of soil and we were getting paid contract on it. And I mean, when you're excavating over 500,000 yards of, of material, you know, say you have it at you know, $2 a, a yard, it could be a huge impact and cost and being able to track that and submit to them like, hey, this is how much yardage of overburden we took out that we agreed to on contracts and being able to prove that none of that was impacted was huge. Um, you don't have to give specifics for, for confidentiality, but can you give a, a really rough range in what the business or financial impact was from this information? Well, it, was, it, was, it was in the millions, for sure, definitely. And you said you've been day. using... Oh, go ahead. Sorry. With our T&M tickets every day and our yardage that we would take out, you know, every other day to remove overburden, yeah, it was a huge financial impact. And without without the drone, it would have been very difficult using rover shots and documenting that and being able to prove that to the owner, you know, that quantity that we are trying to bill for. What do you think would have happened on the project if you hadn't had any drone data? Uh, my, I, I wouldn't sleep. <laughs> um, <laughs> organizing, organizing, organizing all the data with with the drone data. It's, it's there. It's pictures. The pictures don't lie, and and the quantities are very accurate. You know, when I take out the impacted material, so it, was, it helped out a lot. And plus, these holes are about 50 to 60 feet deep, and having a guy on the ground have to shoot through those slopes and you know it was, it was just real dangerous for him and with the drone it just one it's not a problem given that you did have this data available how did the customer react when you presented them the the unexpected additional work um <laughs> they're a little shocked uh, but it is what it is and you know that's what we agreed to so but I mean it was just help for documentation wise like you know you could see as the whole progressed you can see the limits of excavation that we did on T&M and what we did on contract work but yeah. they I mean, they they understand you know what the financial impact on the project was because of this impacted soil and yeah, we we have to remediate. We have to get rid of it. Has has drone data been useful in any other aspect of the jobs, like um, haul roads? Yeah, so uh, definitely our haul road planning, especially around all these impacted pits. So we have five of them over the site um, right now. We're filling. We have one of them filled up. We're working on the second one, and we're moving on to the start of the third one right now. But um, yeah, so we have this thing in our contract as well called station overhaul. So for for 
our bidding purposes, we had to submit to the owner, you know, a certain uh, amount of feet that we are, we are saying that we're going to move this dirt. So we plan on flip flopping this whole job, you know, within a certain amount of feet. And every hundred feet that we go beyond that, due to a design change or like impacted soil change, things like this, some some unforeseen condition, uh, we would get paid an extra five cents per cubic yard per hundred foot station that we would go over. So every day when we track our P and M tickets, we are also putting together our station overhaul maps for our scraper halls around these holes and having to pull soil from places that we didn't bid this job to pull it from. So just tracking that, being able to use the measure tool on the side identified with the pictures that shows that you can't miss our haul route that day helped out a lot. That was another impact on, you know, our the financial side of the the contract. Were there any other specific tools that you found particularly valuable um, within Identified's product? Yeah, for uh, for example, the when we whenever we're doing finished grade, when I come when I do my client card for quantity of finished grade, I can see on the drone like which super blocks or blocks tabs that we finished in those two weeks just based off the last drone flight compared to the next one. So that helped out a lot just to be able to draw a, a rough rectangle or square of the pad that we finished. So that helped out a lot. I do a lot I do a lot in Act Deck as well with the data that is provided. So um, about 90% of our users also use Zagtech just because we're, we're so earth moving focused. So w did you find it relatively easy to export data from identified into Agtech? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it's really easy. I mean, I'm only looking for two files and that's the DXF file, which is the contours generated from the point cloud. Um, and the GeoTIFF, the GeoTIFF is huge. GeoTIFF is all the pictures stitched together. And I pretty much import that into Actech and the DXF file, and it's you know you can't. It's a really good visual aid, and that helps with a lot of our maps and things like that. Gotcha. And did you did you use it for anything else? Um, I, I think you mentioned at one point uh, like potentially f photographs, video, um, just for oh, yeah. either marketing or, or, or reference. Yeah, definitely for uh, job progress, you know, showing owners and showing upper management, you know, where we're at and what's going on on the site. Um, yeah, I use it for for taking pictures and videos, and you know, I post it on you know LinkedIn to show as well, just what we're doing. It's been really helpful. In, in terms of collaboration, either with um, upper level management or with clients. Um, is it ever important in terms of dealing with subcontractors or are you guys actually managing most of the job yourself? Yeah, so we got the rough grading portion of the job, but there's other contractors that got, you know, the underground and the paving and the concrete and whatnot. But I mean, they're not our subcontractors, but we provide all that information to the owner so they can track, you know, how much pipe is being laid every day and, you know, how much square feet of asphalt is being paid or linear footage of curve that's being poured. So the owner is very happy, you know, with the data that we provide them and graphs and maps and whatnot. Nice. For, for other companies similar to Granite, do you think having, I mean, would you recommend uh, a managed drone solution? Yeah, no, for sure. I, I mean, I couldn't imagine doing this, a job similar to this without one and I know and you, the cost the cost of the drone has paid for itself you know <laughs> times a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah it, it sounds like for the seven months you've been using it you've got a pretty good ROI yeah yeah <laughs> um, I know you 
came into Granite already knowing a lot more about drones than than your average person. And I'm curious, given given that you've been following this for a while, given that you've seen the evolution of drone mapping and really been in kind of the the forefront of it, wh where do you expect to see drone mapping a few years out, maybe five or ten years out from today? Well, yeah, sky's the limit, and I mean, it's it's pretty it's pretty advanced now, but with you know all the other features that are coming out, it's the opportunities are endless. Um, yeah, just having the automated, not having to use ground control, the PPK version, I'm really interested. In. I need to, you know, get some more background on it to understand it some more. But yeah, I see it going, going up, progressing very, very fastly. Um, both for for you and the other members of the audience, we actually do have a webinar completely focused on PPK. Um, so I'll uh, I'll share that. Um, in, in the chat box so so if people want to check that out they can um, the last question I have before I turn this over to the audience so please if anyone has any questions for Jeff um, feel free to enter them um, again the uh, the way to enter your questions is uh, is shown on the screen but just for me personally um, Jeff is there anything else I should have asked you or that you'd like to say to our audience Oh, it's just uh, for people out there, just don't be scared of technology. And, um, the world is changing, and you know if you don't go along with it, you're gonna get left in the dust. And that's what I've realized. You know, you know, hearing about it and actually using it, you know, in real life and seeing the benefits, it's it's, it's the future. I, w I was just listening to a podcast on um, artificial intelligence, and they were saying a lot of people worry that it's going to be man versus machine, but it's really not. It's going to be man versus man plus machine. And as long yeah. as you are using these tools and taking advantage of them, you have a huge leg up on everybody else. Um, so in terms of questions, um, if if people do have follow-up questions, Jeff, do you mind? I have your LinkedIn profile up on the screen, uh, LinkedIn slash IN slash Jeff, G-O-N-Z-O. Do you mind if people reach out to you if they have a follow-up question? Oh, well, it's fine. I, I like collaborating with other people and you know sharing insights and getting uh, other point of views and opinions on things. So yeah, feel free. Always available. OK. Um, Alvin asked Jeff if you utilized uh, certified surveyors. Yeah, so we of course we have a third party surveyor that the owner uh, hired. Um, they are out there staking for storm drain sewer stuff. But um, yeah, there's contractors out there that are using them and not using GPS. So yeah, we're running this whole job on GPS. We have three rovers and. We have um, we have a nine, a ten, and our one forty and blade that have uh, machine control on them. But yeah, there's definitely third party surveyors out there. In terms of speed, can you compare maybe what a single surveyor, uh, how much ground they can cover in in a half day versus a drone? Well, yeah, let's just use the example of having myself go out there and sofa with the rover a hundred acres compared to the drone it would take me you know a couple hours to get a detailed topo of an area in which the drone can go and fly in 15 minutes and depending on how many pictures it is you know the turnaround time for it to be processed it's i mean yeah if you need it right away yeah we we go and shoot stockpiles or certain certain things with the rover, but in a whole flight, you know, a four flight, fifteen minutes, you know, in, in about an hour, I can soak both the whole entire site and have it back, and that that map with all the contours and whatnot. Right? I mean, sometimes it takes long, like a day. Sometimes it takes two days, but and that's that's I mean, 
to teleport the whole site with the rover would be insane. I, I wouldn't even fathom it. I mean, are, are we talking about multiple days, like or weeks? No, yeah, it would take multiple days. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I put up links to the PPK uh, webinar if people want to check that out. There's also a PDF uh, slide deck. I put up a link to uh, a drone mapping demo if it's something people are interested in exploring. And we also do um, an offer where if you fill out a survey, there's a chance of a free month of uh, drone mapping. So all of that is in the uh, chat box. And um, with that, Jeff, man, I, I really appreciate you sharing your experience um, with the audience. I know they appreciate it, and I'm sure you'll get a couple of uh, follow-up questions and comments. And uh, I appreciate you being a, an identified partner. Yeah, no problem. And, and it just, I mean, it all comes down to cost. If you can fit this, you know, the cost of the drone and the service that you guys provide and your guys to fit and you think it would pay off, you know, it's, it's, it's worth the risk. Because if we didn't put this in our bid and didn't expect to use it, it would have been a, a bad situation for us. We would have probably ended up having to pay for it or pay for someone to come fly and do it, you know, out of, you know, pocket a cost that we didn't expect to incur in a bid. But if you build into your bid, I mean, you can justify it with, you know, using it and seeing how it works and how it paid off. So that's what it really comes down to is the cost of it. It, it feels like you originally planned on using it just for kind of its own means, but it ended up being useful for insurance, just to sort of have yeah. locked in reference. Yeah, and documentation too. I mean, if you know, a couple of years from now something comes up, you can always go back and look at the maps and you know come you know come up with because at the end of the job it's going to be you know, a punch list of some sort or you know the owner's going to fight some kind of quantity or whatnot. You can always go back. And, Compare that those two flights, or you know, compare a month month flight compared to the last month flight, and prove to them, you know, that this actually happened. And without it, I mean, it would be really hard to do that. Jeff, we had one other question. Um, this is actually from uh, another Jeff. Um, he, he was asking what uh, what type of drone you use. I know we offer a few, so I, I wasn't sure which one you're actually using on this project. So this, the one I'm using is the Inspire one, and mm -hmm. I'm very happy with it. It's it's very powerful drone. Um, the flight time is about 20 minutes on it. Um, it it moves pretty fast, um, and it takes care of the wind if there is any. Um, I try not to fly when it's you know a decent wind, but I mean if there is a little bit of wind, it it definitely can take care of a flight, you know. But it's just not going to fly as long. So yeah, the so, Inspire One. It's, it's, I've always been a fan of it before I even got on board with Identify. Um, it was always one of the top of line drones that DJI sells. I will say, if you end up going with PPK, um, that that will come bundled with the uh, DJI Inspire Two now. And one of the coolest oh. things about that for me is it's it's a little more accurate, which is is great. But it actually has seek and avoid built in so you physically cannot fly this thing into an obstacle um even you know, no matter how hard you try <laughs> so I, I i find uh you know I, I sleep a little bit better at night just not having to worry about that yeah no for sure that's huge especially our job is next to a an airport it's not a huge international airport but it, there's definitely a part of the job where i have to unlock it and yeah everything's yeah. been pretty smooth um, we haven't had too many close calls, but as long as you're out there watching it fly, um, and if you do see a potential of a, you know, a plane coming or a helicopter or something, it's it's pretty easy to pause the mission and move it out of the way or lower it. But I don't fly over 400 feet. So. I I know you were already using drones um, before you met us. So did you use our flight services team or our flight training team at all? Um, as part of your no. your process? No, it was all just for recreation. Just we had a 
we had a Phantom 4, granted to us, that I would fly and just take pictures of jobs. So never used it for actual totally. Well, for, like, I, I didn't know if you've worked with our VP of Aviation, uh, John Little here, or, or Cassie at all, um, on maybe Part 107 training or uh, anything like that. Well, yeah, you have to, well, commercially, if you're using it to make money, whether you're, you're shooting weddings or, you know, using it for construction, you have to get your Part 107 license. And, yeah, I mean, they supplied me with all the information I needed, and I studied for it maybe three days before I took the test and passed it with flying colors. So that's what I like um, to we hear. Had, yeah, we had we had four people from our company take the test and three out of four passed it. And the fourth person that didn't pass it only missed missed it by one. So I, I hope just everybody that passed it, gave them grief though. Yeah, it's 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 just common sense, you know. I mean they do that for a reason. It keeps people that are just don't know what they're doing, you know, out of the air. So it's definitely a safety issue. Um, but yeah, just study your sectional maps and you'll be fine. <laughs> what, what kind of mistakes would you worry that somebody would make if they had not prepared for the 107? Like what, what kind of operational uh, things do they teach you to look out for? Um, just like, you know, where you can fly and where you can't fly, you know not flying it into, you know, an active airspace or a restricted airspace would be one. And two, just, you know, just, just being smart, not taking any chances and being aware of your surroundings. Yeah. Awesome, Jeff. Um, this has been a great conversation. Thank you for off, uh, answering my questions and the audience's questions.